Welcome to 558 Parkside Tech, where we talk about everything tech, from coding to design, from the past, the present, and the future of tech. Our goal is to educate the culture. I'm your tech plug, Mike. Let's get it right after the jump. 558 Parkside Tech, in effect, that tech, 558 Parkside Tech, in effect, that tech, 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 in the future. Let me introduce you. 558 Parkside Tech, about to school you. 558 Parkside Tech, in effect, that tech, tech, 558 Parkside Tech, in effect, that tech, tech, 558 Parkside Tech, in effect, that tech, 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 Park, 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 son. Today we're talking about unified modeling language, also known as UML, and this is part two of our object-oriented programming series. You see, back in the day, or should I say back in the day day, because I'm talking about 1980 and the 90s, many people prior to writing out code would actually depict their code in a diagram. And they would share with others about what they would do. Or sometimes they would just do it for themselves so they can see the flow and make sure they wasn't leaving out any of the business rules that whatever user was requiring. But we use different types of diagram formats. We used hypo diagrams, flow diagrams, you name it. And every time you got with somebody, they could barely read the diagram that you came up with. So in 1997, because that was an issue in, in all your departments, a group of engineers got together and they came up with UML, Unified Modeling Language Diagrams. And this was supposed to be a unified or uniformed way of writing out what we do in software. Now there were different UML diagram types. There's structured diagrams, behavior diagrams, there's, and within your structured diagrams, you have composite, deployment, packaging, profile. And under behavior, you have activity and use cases and, and state language and interaction diagrams. But today we're gonna to talk about class diagrams because it fits in with our previous part one when we were talking about object-oriented programming. Here is an example of how to create an object in you are using a class diagram under UML. And you can see there are some symbols that apply. We call them visibility or encapsulation. Plus is for public, minus is private, pound sign is protected, and a tilde is a package. And you can see here that we have our fields or attributes, and on the right we have our, our characters or integers that apply to them. We also have our methods symbolized here within this diagram. Now one of the things we talked about in part one, we talked about inheritance. And I said that's something that everybody should be familiar with. It's like a child inheriting from a parent. They get exactly what that parent had. No changes, exactly what they had. And in this case, we're depicting a friend object. And that friend object is going to be inherited by real friends and Facebook friends. And in this case, we call those child objects. The parent object being friends. And you can see how it's laid out here that in your real friends, you have a public birth date. Why? Because that plus sign symbols that it's public. The Facebook friend object, child object, has a plus email message. And they're going to be inheriting everything from the friends. This is how it's depicted in a UML diagram. Now here, what I'm showing you is how that would look if you were writing c -sharp code. You can see that that diagram, that class diagram in UML, translates very well when you're actually writing code because now that friend object turns into a class object over to your right. String name, I'm actually applying in this example, Nancy, and string type of friend, I'm applying best. There we have our method, set name. But what I want you to get out of this, by me showing you this, is understand the format. Understand the brackets and the relationships. Every open bracket has a closed bracket. Even under methods, every open bracket has a closed bracket. Every single statement, all your variables or attributes have a semicolon. It's important to remember semicolons. I'm gonna keep dropping little tidbits, little dimes of information on you about coding so that when we get there, it's not like, voila, magic, we're coding. I want you to slowly grasp that as we go through this object-oriented programming series. So now what have you gathered so far? 
I showed you a UML diagram and explained to you how class diagram can be built out of that. The benefits is that when you sh you're able to share your, your thoughts with everybody else without actually writing the code, and they may see that you're actually leaving out something, and you may have to add another diagram or add another box showing another method because something's left out because the use case that you're trying to satisfy hasn't been satisfied by your diagram. You also know now that there are many different types of UML diagrams. Now, if anyone can't remember some of the pillars that we talked about, please go back to the previous lesson of object-oriented programming, part one, in this link. Thank you for joining us today. And if you enjoyed the content, please feel free and subscribe or join us at 558parksidetech.com. And remember, program or be programmed. And be greater than your greatest excuse and learn tech. For life and tech waits for no one. Peace. Tap in the future, let me introduce you. 558 Parkside Tech, about to school you.